Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Red Seat Season 3. I'm Omid Mogadat joining you from Tehran. And once again, I'm so thankful to have the chance to be connected with all of you from around the world. And I'm so, so thankful also that you all join us in this educational platform. And I have to say, as always, as I mentioned in all sessions, I want to thank all the guests who accepted the invitation and are joining us, helping all of us as a family of dentists and implantologists to becoming better and better day by day by sharing their knowledge and their experience. And as you all know, in season three, our main focus is going to be on going through the case presentations and review all things that we've learned from basics over the past two seasons. So I think this season is going to be more practical for all of you. And today, I have another special guest, Dr. Mohamed Bassam from Lebanon. I'm so happy that he joined. Hello, Mohamed, and welcome to Hunter, my friend. Hello. I'm so happy uh, to be with you on the hot seat. It's the hottest seat on the, on the social media lately. So uh, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be with you. Uh, you're a really you well know me through uh, in the world and dental experts, uh, your symposium, your comp I think you have this symposium. Yeah. Then our complications in search. Yeah. So uh, I'm very happy to be with you and hopefully I will share what I do on my daily practice and be fruitful for you and for the, um, for the audience. I'm pretty, sure, I'm pretty sure it is going to be like exactly what you said. And you know, the topic that Dr. Bas talked about for us as, is actually one of the topics that we haven't covered over the past two seasons. And we're going to talk about lateral vertical augmentation procedures, but, but his focus is going to be on a technique called tent pole technique. I'm pretty sure it's among the favorite techniques of many of you guys. And we have details in this technique that we should know how to select the defect, how to select the technique, how to case select a proper case for such techniques. And I'm pretty sure that he will cover all the details for all of us and with showing his amazing skills during his case presentation. And as a routine, I would like to have first Dr. Mohamed Bassam's CV, a short CV for all of you. And then we will start the presentation for sure, as our routine, we're going to have a discussion on the topic at the end of his presentation. Dr. Mohamed Bassam is an ITI member and also a member of the American Academy of Technology, graduated as general practitioner in 2006 and practicing since then. Also graduated as a specialist in the field of technology and implantology from the Lebanese University. And his focus on practice is on full muscle rehabilitations, hard and soft tissue and dentistry and also in aesthetic dentistry for the last few years that he has experience on that. He also has presented several lectures and has conducted many workshops in advanced periodontics and implant dentistry. Also, I have to say that he's one of the speakers at Roots and I'm pretty sure you are familiar with his beautiful works because his page on Instagram is full of amazing, amazing works that you can check it out and learn from his experience. And I'm, I, have to, I have to say that I'm, again, so happy that he accepted the invitation and are joining us in Hot Seat today and will share with you his experience on Temple Technique. Mohamed, again, I'm so happy, my friend, so you can start your presentation. We're looking forward for your beautiful cases. Yeah, uh, I'm so happy to be with you uh, and to meet you one on one. Um, just trying to find the share screen. He's uh, Okay. Um, uh, just names in the, uh, in the field of periodontics and uh, dental implants. Uh, I, as uh, Dr. Amit said, I'm from Lebanon. Um, it's a beautiful country that I love and accordingly now, due to the curfews and the pandemic that we are in uh, and the airports that are closed, we are forbidden. 
we said uh, we're going to talk about uh, tenting, uh, to tent or not to tent, that is the question. Um, I'm going to go uh, through the um, through the, these procedures by two uh, using two uh, two cases. Um, these two cases, um, what I call challenging, is um, not the case that you see uh, once or twice a year. What I what I call challenging is what you see every day. The cases that you see every day and you have to deal with it that are a little bit complicated. Have to deal with it on daily basis easy way for you and for the, for the doctor or the practitioner and, and the patient and uh, to make it uh, predictable of course and to uh, have a satisfied patient. Uh, in these two cases the first one is uh, in the posterior mandible and the second one is in the aesthetic zone and uh, in both cases um, what is common is the lack of bone. So, um, what is important to, uh, to know is that uh, when you're working on private practice, um, you have to, uh, to work easy and you have to simplify your surgeries uh, in a predictable way. And this is what we're going to cover today. And with the help of 10 polls, as you're going you're gonna to see in the presentation, um, it's going to be an additive uh, tool uh, in your drawers. But first, we have to talk a little bit about the defect anatomy. Uh, these techniques, are, uh, this technique is not uh, really suitable for all cases. Um, so uh, I usually go uh, with this uh, prolonged classification of alveolar ridge defects, uh, which categorize um, defect anatomy in part one, two, and three. And part one, the orientation, if it's horizontal, vertical, or it is combined with sinus. And a part two, if it's low less than four millimeter, two medium between four and eight, and high more than eight, and a relation of augmentation and the defect region if it's internal inside the contour or external outside the rich contour. So I'm going to go quickly in this uh, in this article or this in this consensus. Uh, they went they they made a decision tree, and uh, I'm going to localize the defects that we're going to work on. Then uh, the defects that we're going to work on are horizontal and vertical, that is less than four millimeter. And uh, usually, um, um, usually I go with stabiliz stabilization in all cases, but here they mention uh, some of the treatments that is not with stabilization membrane. So this is for the, the one, this is for the mandible and the one before was for the maxilla. And so, uh, the second thing that, so, uh, so uh, let's sum, we're going to talk about the defects that are uh, around four millimeter, more or less four, five millimeter, or less than four millimeter. So, uh, what are the material of choice? I'm gonna, not going to go through all of this because it's going to be more practical. Uh, let me tell you that before talking, the, uh, uh, before talking about the material of choice, um, I always uh, follow the GBR principles that are, uh, and all the passport that was uh, uh, that was mentioned by uh, Professor Wang Ha Wang uh, et al. Uh, in 2006, which is primary closure, angiogenesis, space creation, and wound stability. And I would add a fifth corner of this pyramid, uh, which is the surgeon himself and his talent and how he's dealing with the cases and how he's selecting the case. So, um, talking about the material of choice, I always include a pathogenous bone during my, uh, in my GBRs. Okay, so we're using, of course, the tenting poles and the GBR. So, I always include the pathogenous bone that I'm going to mix with either xenograft, allograft, but basically with xenograft as per Professor Eastman Urban. So, uh, usually uh, I collect the uh, the autogenous bone using scraper or these beautiful twist tools or during my uh, drilling for implants, I just collect the bone that I'm drilling. So uh, another thing, let's talk a little bit about GBR versus bone blocks. Uh, actually, uh, what is, I'm talking about the bone block, not the Khoury technique. So in one of the reviews, systemic reviews, 
the fate of lateral augmentation. The fate of lateral ridge augmentation systemic review, it showed that QBR and bone block, the, the amount of bone that you're getting via bone blocks is not more than the GBR, it's a little bit more uh, like one millimeter, that's it. So GBR is a suitable treatment for our daily practice. On the other, on the other hand, when we're doing these uh, surgeries, we can use as well a non-resolvable membranes, titanium reinforced membranes, and you see here that when you tap on this bone, it's really hard bone that you're, you're, you're getting. It's mostly uh, presented and showed in a, in a very thick book by Professor Eastman Urban. Um, it doesn't mean that GBRs cannot be done this way, but, uh, but there's still some problems when you're doing these techniques. As well with Kuri technique, uh, here for example, to, uh, to augment on the palatal and on the button. Um, the main issue that I face during my, uh, my, my daily practice, or I, I want to avoid during my daily practice, is about uh, complications. So when you're doing your, your, uh, your augmentation procedure, I try to select the least, um, the least uh, technique with complications. So I basically go with resorbable material. Uh, yes, when we're doing Kuri technique or we're doing bone blocks or we're doing a titanium reinforced membranes, we're getting tremendous uh, results. But on the other hand, it's when, whenever you have a complication, the only thing that you can do is just reopen, remove everything, and close. You know, it, in, in, it's very difficult to manage the complication or the infection that you might have after these procedures. And the, 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 what you have to do lately is to remove what you place and wait for the healing and go back again. But when you're using a resorbable material, it's a little bit tolerable. So if you don't get what you want from the first shot, you still have a second shot when you're placing your implant and you can do another additive procedure. So we can start with the first case, which is a posterior mandibles. Many, many, many of the cases that I received, or many of the patients that I received in my daily practice with failed bridges, failed bone bridges, going all the way from the third molar to the canines, or sometimes to the centrals. The extractions were done long time ago, and you, you barely have bone. Like in this case, the patient presented with a failed bridge, so the prosthodontist started his work and he just did his crowns, canine to the other side, and he left the seven and the eight, and we planned for implant on this side. So the first thing I did... So uh, the first thing we did is to extract tooth number seven and tooth number eight, and... Um, Usually what I do, I do this extraction just to make my, uh, my work easier and my surgeries easier later on uh, when I'm manipulating a little bit the soft tissue and closing over my, uh, my bone grafting. So what we did here, we did extraction of these uh, two molars and uh, we waited for soft tissue healing. And the patient came back and uh, for her, I did for her a geographic uh, guide. Uh, as you see here, it's the old school one where you put one dot of uh, guttapeca or any uh, radio-opaque uh, material uh, on your surgical guide. This is the occlusal point, buccal point, and uh, the, one on the, the one on the saddle, on the saddle, okay? So these are the three points. If you see here on the site number, uh, number six, it's here. Uh, you, we have almost three meters, and if you will go with your implant in this side, in this site, you will have your almost whole whole implant of the out of the bone. So, as well here, you can see more the tooth number six and the tooth number five. As well on the tooth number five, if we're gonna place it, it's gonna be almost out of the bone, all the way to uh, all the way to the to the to the apex. Uh, another thing that you you might face if you incline your implant here, it's not gonna be easy when you're restoring it. So. It is important as well to, uh, to make a link of uh, that you're placing your implants to be restored, not to make it 
too difficult for the uh, prosthodontist to restore it. So the first thing that I'm gonna do here, I'm gonna do my incisions. Here uh, we have a lack of uh, soft tissue as well. We have lack of uh, keratinized tissue here in the middle. So uh, we have a combined, uh, combined, um, uh, combined, let's say, uh, problems. That is, we have lack of soft tissue and we have lack of hard tissue. So what I do, I do my incision on the mid of the crest and I will split my keratinized tissue in two. And uh, I barely do a vertical incisions in the uh, posterior mandible. Uh, usually what, what I do, I do a releasing incision a little bit of the distal, uh, let's say five, six, seven millimeter away from my augmentation or where my implant will be, uh, just to keep uh, a place for my... Mesial side, I, I, I barely do vertical incisions, especially in the mandible, uh, as you're gonna see. So then I will do a debridement of my, uh, my site, uh, a very good debridement to remove all granulation tissue, and then I will go for decortication, and then I will put my tenting post. Uh, important things to talk here about the tenting poles usually what you get uh, what we got what we have uh, the data that we have from the studies is that um, with GBR you're gonna get three to four millimeter uh, if you get five millimeter will be uh, will be tremendous but usually you have this range of four millimeter uh, it doesn't really make sense to place your tenting pole uh, beyond uh, four millimeters. So it's a four to five millimeter. It will be great. You don't need to uh, put it, let's say six or seven or eight, because you're not gonna uh, get this much. This is one. Uh, you will harm the. Uh, you will. You will risk have a puncture of your soft tissue. This is true, because the bone will resorb and you will have your uh, your tenting ball just going out of the bone and it's gonna risk punching your soft tissue. What is the, importing of the, uh, the importance of the tenting poles? Um, in cases of GBR lateral ridge augmentation or vertical augmentation, uh, the, the important thing is to support your bone. So we don't, you don't need any uh, pressure over your bone. Uh, so you, you can get that either with, let's say the titanium mesh, you can get that with the plates of Kuri, Kuri, Kuri plates, you can get that with, uh, titanium uh, reinforced membranes where this hard material will support the flap and will uh, reduce the pressure that you, you're having over your, uh, your bone grafting and your membrane. So the tenting poles here will be uh, helping you to support your membrane in the horizontal position as well as going to support your bone packing on the vertical uh, aspect. So. Uh, so you're gonna, we're gonna place our tenting poles not more than four to five millimeters. And unfortunately, I did not take a lateral view uh, in this case where I will place my tenting poles 45 degrees inclined, four millimeter, four to five millimeter out of the bone, and it will not be going off the uh, uh, of the crest. So it should be at the level or below the level of the crest. Uh, Another thing that is important to say um, uh, is the tension that you're going to have over your uh, bone grafting. The most tension that you're going to have on the, on the bone grafting of the flap tension over the bone grafting is uh, usually at the edges, especially when you have an adjacent tooth like this one. So it is important here to place a, a, a tenting screw at this area just to support your most mesial and the most distal part of your GVR. And you're gonna see later on in the result where we had most of the resorption. As well, before placing my tenting poles, an important thing to do and do the cortication, of course, an important thing to do is to locate your mental nerve. Uh, the importance of locating your mental nerve is that uh, later on you're gonna do a, a little dissection to release your buccal flap and as well, you don't want to traumatize your, uh, your mental nerve. 
some practitioner, practitioners like to expose the whole foramen, is expose the whole nerve going out of the foramen. For me, I don't really uh, see any need in cases like this. So you're just gonna uh, locate it, make sure this is your mental foramen, 100% this is it, you're not uh, um, confused with any depression on the buccal side of the bone. And you will see later on, uh, if you don't expose the mental nerve, how your, the shape of your bone will be. So another thing to be, uh, to be uh, uh, with, another thing that is important uh, is the lingual flap elevation and the lingual flap management that was described by Professor Isvin Urban. Tunneling, first we're gonna talk about the zone one. Zone one is the most distal. Uh, it's uh, where we're gonna do a tunneling and lifting of the uh, retro uh, molar pad. And on zone two, usually what we do is uh, flap separation of the myeloidian uh, muscle. Uh, we just gonna try to pull. We can use. Uh, you can use your perioprob. You can just choose, use a little bit of pressure while holding your your flap with the tweezer and trying to push it. It's gonna be uh, relief of, of the myeloidian muscle. And in the anterior zone, you 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 will need a semi blunt peristeal uh, release. You will see here, for example that uh, you're getting almost a 15 millimeter uh, by only releasing your uh, lingual flap. An important thing to, to say is, why am I uh, releasing a lingual flap uh, if I'm not doing uh, vertical uh, augmentation? Uh, and uh, Professor Isvan Urban really described it when he was talking about vertical, uh, vertical augmentations. Uh, actually, uh, when we are doing GBRs, uh, we usually do a, not only a, ver, uh, a horizontal augmentation, we're doing as well a slight vertical augmentation. And when we're doing our GBR, uh, it's imp an important thing to do is overcorrection. So you will have a, a bulk of bone that you've placed and covered with membrane, and you really need soft tissue coat to cover it. And sometimes your buccal flap is not enough to close over your uh, your uh, GBR, uh, especially when you're not you don't want to uh, traumatize out to reduce your traumatization of, of the nerve. So uh, by managing your lingual flap, you will get 15 to 20 millimeter of a vertical release of your flap that will help you closing over your um, uh, over your GBR. So. Uh, Another thing to talk is the mental nerve section that we're gonna, first we have to locate the mental nerve. We will cut uh, one millimeter only of the periosteum, which be four to six millimeter away from the mental nerve, our mental foramen. And our uh, cut will be uh, superficial and our dissection should be superficial to reduce uh, the trauma of the nerve. And we use, uh, we usually uh, use, or I usually use a brushing movement when I'm releasing my buccal flap. Uh, so as you see here, we located the mental nerve, uh, mental foramen, and then I'm away four to six millimeter. And this is how the, I will design my, uh, my incision, my periosteal uh, incision. That was described by, uh, by Mark Ronda. Uh, so the tenting ball in, in place, a decortication was done, and uh, we do our release uh, of uh, the flap. Usually, um, I don't release the buckle flap until I place my bone and I place my screws and uh, pins and stabilize my membrane, and then I will go with uh, with a periosteal incision and release of the flap. Because to release the flap, you will have lots of uh, blood. So here I used, uh, uh, of course, I mixed autogenous with the xenograft with a bioguide membrane over it. And I um, fixed my membrane with screws in this case. You can either use screws or pins and then I closed over it. Um, what I like to do is to close my flap in, uh, on two uh, levels, first periosteum to periosteum using horizontal matrix that you can see here, one, two, three. And if I, see, if, I, if I see that I need more on the measure, I will do it. And then I will close it 
superficial layer with uh, uh, continuous uh, uh, sling sutures or uh, continuous suture or with uh, uh, separated sutures. So this is the case uh, at day zero, and this is the case at fifth, five months. So you see that we have already uh, a good bone, and we can almost not see uh, our screws. As we said, I placed four screws. You can easily locate two screws here and another two that you cannot see on the 3D uh, model. So uh, this is the case before, and this is the case prior to implant or re-entry. And an important thing to say is whenever you're doing your GBRs, you're going to lose more and more of your keratinized tissue. You're hearing me well? Okay. So this is the re-entry at five, five months. We had almost seven to eight millimeter of fridge that we're going to, is really uh, uh, helpful to place our implants. So this is the bone grafting that we've done, and this is the result before and after. The easiest place to locate is the mental foramen. Uh, as I told you, um, if I don't expose my whole foramen and I don't expose my whole nerve, I will keep the periosteum attached in this area, and it's gonna give, it will give me a nice emergence of my nerve here and nice bone in this area. So the periosteum itself will make like a small bed for my bone to sit on. So mainly we had enough bone to place our implants as well here in, uh, on, uh, on the implant at uh, the site number six. I told you that the implant will be almost out of the bone. We had nice horizontal augmentation, and if you see here, we had a nice vertical augmentation as well. That's going to help us later on because the height over the nerve was almost eight millimeter. So if I didn't get this two millimeter extra, I wouldn't be able to place an eight millimeter implant. I would have gone to six millimeter implant. In cases like this, uh, I, I usually use uh, guided surgery. Unfortunately, in this case, the three shape didn't release its, oh, the studio by three shape didn't release its bone supported guide. So I just made a simple guide that is supported by the teeth to help me locate the position of my ears. And then if you see here, I really had to dig to find my tenting poles. So we dig a little bit to find our tenting poles and remove them. Here I had a slight resorption. I had a slight resorption on this one as well. We removed the tenting poles, removed the screws, placed my three implant size 4.1, that was Stroman, I remember. And I think this is enough for us. At this uh, point, I will never close uh, without doing a baby bone graft. I usually do the baby bone graft. I just add a little bit of bone and cover it with membrane and close over it. Uh, it will help us uh, to uh, get nicer bone, a uh, more rigid bone. Just as, what, as, as, as it was described by Professor Istvan Urban after using his PTFE membranes. So this is uh, the case after placing our implants. We have, and this is at the healing, of four months after placing implant. This, this is the implant number four, this is the implant number six, and this is the implant number seven. And this is the sequence of the case. If you see how the defect was here, how straight it is here, okay? So let's say here we had a little bit of vertical augmentation, let's say two millimeter and horizontal augmentation. So this is how the patient came. This is at bone grafting. This is after placing the implants. And this is after uh, placing our healing abutments. So as we said, patient came afterwards 
with three implants inside with nice bone around, but we have lack of keratinized tissue. So what I do here, I do dissection of my uh, buccal flap. I suture it, and then I will go to the palate to get my free gingival graft. Simple procedure. And I will place it over my implants. I do the first stabilization. When I do these surgeries, the, the free gingival graft, I expand, extend beyond my, uh, my dis the most distal implant, around four millimeter. And then I stabilize it more. So this is the case at the day of grafting. And this is at the suture removal. After removing moving stitches, and this is at day zero, this is at day 10, and this is at day 20. And this is how the case was, and this is how it, uh, it became. Enough hard bone, enough soft uh, tissue around our implants, and uh, an important thing to say, we need always not less than two millimeter of buccal bone around our implants. So that was the first case. If you allow me to start the second one. Okay. So, um, I'm gonna go through the second one uh, quick. Uh, unfortunately, we're not going to uh, talk about the prosthesis or the prosthetic part because we don't have really much time. Uh, the patient came uh, with his uh, central that was a little bit um, slightly attached to the, to the soft tissue and it was really moving and he was removing it with his hands. Um, he came to me with this situation, of course, poor oral hygiene that we have to enhance, a lot of period things to do here, but really he was basically concerned about his central that is lost. Uh, so I just uh, removed the tooth and cleaned a little bit, wait for, uh, waiting for a nice soft tissue healing. Actually, when I went back to the, to, the, to the file, I saw that this patient was seen in 2017 with a, bone, with a uh, resorption of his root, external resorption. And by that time, uh, the sergeant there uh, told him that he needs to extract and place an implant, and he just uh, uh, he didn't want to, to do the treatment. And he came in 2018 with this situation where he had the crown attached to the soft tissue, uh, resorbed uh, root, and uh, part of the root uh, deep inside. So I took a CBCT for the patient, and I saw that he didn't eat, he didn't lose only buccal bone. How uh, he didn't only lose vertical uh, horizontal uh, bone, but he also uh, lost some vertical bone, which was a little bit slight, let's say around two millimeters. So I explained to the patient that we need to rebuild this bone in this area, remove the root, rebuild this bone prior to our implant placement. So what we're going to discuss today is rebuilding the bone and placing our implant. So uh, I really didn't want to open big flaps in this case. Uh, when we're working on uh, resorbable material, we don't really need our resorbable membranes. We don't really need to extend our, uh, our flaps. Uh, because um, when, when, we're using, when we're doing our uh, GBR, let's say, with uh, um, titanium reinforced membranes, uh, the PTFE, the non-resorbable membrane, or the titanium mesh, we don't want to uh, have the edge of our flap close to uh, our mesh or our non-resorbable membrane. That would risk um, exposure of the membrane infection and later on maybe dealing with this complication or uh, just opening and removing everything and wait for the healing and go back for another surgeon. So uh, when we're doing, um, when we're using resorbable material, we can reduce our, uh, our flaps. In this case, 
made two vertical incisions, uh, spared my, uh, my uh, papillas, and I elevated my flap. If you can see here, I can see the root, a little bit of Gita Perka here in the middle. So I had to um, uh, really um, nicely remove the root and not traumatize the bone, not to uh, lose more bone because I needed to build on it. And this is the defect now. I have loss of vertical, I have loss of buccal bone, I have this big defect here that is let's say it's somehow contained. So what I decided to do is to place my tenting screw, tenting pole, vertical and vertical position. An important thing to talk about here is um, how big is the screw? Uh, usually if you're using screws with big heads, it's better. That is gonna, ha it's gonna support your membrane uh, more. So. Uh, where to place your vertical uh, screw, uh, I placed it right where I want to place my implant. It will help me in two things. First of the, the first thing, uh, when I remove it, I will not need to graft. The second is that it's going to be like my first drill. How much do I extend my, uh, my tenting screw? Important thing to talk to to, to say when we're uh, talking about vertical augmentations is the bone, bone peak that you have on the sides. So don't, uh, you will never augment beyond these two pieces. So that makes sense that uh, placing your screw should not be beyond this line. It should be slightly below this line, okay? Uh, because at the end of the day, you're gonna have some pressure in this area. So you don't want to uh, have your uh, screw punching your punching your your um, your soft tissue and uh, expose. So I placed my tenting pole vertically, and then I mixed autogenous with xenograft. I used, sorry, I used. Uh, a resorbable membrane here, a cross-linked membrane, memlock by biorisons, uh, stabilized with autotax. As well, I added a layer of bioguide, another membrane over it, and uh, I used a periosteal suture from periosteum to periosteum, buckle to palatal, to stabilize my second membrane. Why I did my double membrane here? Uh, I need long-term stability of the membrane. Usually uh, the, the memlock is, let's say three, three months, within three months it's gonna resorb. They, in, the, in their brochures, they say it's gonna stay for four months, but actually no, within three months it's gonna be resorbed. The, uh, the bioguide is going to absorb in two months as well. So using double layer, double layer membranes uh, is important to uh, reduce the, the, the resorbability of the, of the time frame resorbability of your membranes and have more stability of your work or your bone grafting to turn into natural bone. Another thing that is important that I really, I, I read it in one of the studies is that uh, the, the cross-link membranes are more, um, like we, well, actually we can have more exposure of the membrane uh, with cross-linked versus non-cross-linked. So I prefer to place a non-cross-linked -cross, uh, first and non-cross-linked over it. And then I closed over my membrane. So this is the situation. And this is the situation right after the GBR. And this is the situation when the patient came after five months. I see that almost what I placed is still there. This is the CBCT after. This is my tenting pole. This is the bone that I gained, almost eight 
8.25. Uh, 8 millimeter is more than enough to place an implant and leave two millimeter buckle and two millimeter palatal. So this is the case before when the patient came and this is the, the case when the patient came for uh, placing his implant. So this is this before when I placed the tenting pole and this is the case when I re-entered. So this is the amount of bone that we've gained. In these cases as well, I prefer to go guided. So what I did here, I placed the implant via guided surgery, just to make it perfect placement. An important thing to say here, at the most coronal part, the, soft, the bone is really soft. I prefer to remove it. And as I, I always go with a baby bone graft, so I just place another bone graft and cover it with my membrane. So this is the, the position of my tenting pole. This prior, prior the, uh, before I remove it. So this is the tenting pole placed. It's right where the implant should be. And this is the implant in place. And this is the CVCT. This is my implant. Uh, important thing to say why I went guided because uh, in most of the cases where usually now we're, we, more, we tend more to place our crowns for a screw retained uh, uh, solutions. So we place it a little bit to the pad, palate. So we risk to have exposure of our perforation of the buckle plate. So when we are placing our implant with the guided surgery, we really uh, try to do it the perfect way. And if you see here, this is my baby bone graft over my implant. And here, this is the bone that we've built. This is the full cuts. And this is my implant. I have more than two millimeter on the buckle, buckle bone. So I'm on the safe side. And at the end, uh, I want to say that during our surgeries, especially in GBR, posterior mandible, uh, static zone, upper, lower, we have to respect the anat anatomical features. We have to, to uh, study our defect anatomy and select our cases, of course, as you said, uh, Doc. Using autogenous bone is a must for me. I always use autogenous bone. Uh, Sentence that I like, go big or go home. Always over correction when you're doing your GBRs. Always stabilize your membrane. However, whatever the case was, stabilize your membrane. You don't have tax, you have your sutures. Just do your periosteal suture and stabilize your membrane. Two millimeter of buckle bone over your implant is a must, especially in the aesthetic zone. And what you're gonna get from GBR is three to four millimeter of gain per attempt. But fortunately, when I'm using tenting poles uh, or the tent pole technique, I'm get getting more than four millimeter, five, six millimeters sometimes, which is great. Uh, and which is really um, um, delightful, let's say. And thank you. Yeah, thank you so much these great cases that you presented to us, actually, I enjoyed it so much. I'm pretty sure everybody did. You know, uh, so many people really don't think about 10 pole techniques as successful as it really is, you know? And the most important point that I think you mentioned, and I'm truly, truly agree with that, is that when you were talking about how should be the length of the screws out of the bone and don't 
put longer screws. That's a very key factor, I believe, in this surgery because so many people think that they can place longer uh, screws so they can gain more bone, and that yeah. will cause for some exposures for them and some complications. And it's not even necessary because most of the patients yeah. have two millimeters of bone, and we want to make it to six. So only four millimeter screw out of yeah. the can be enough and make the surgery as predictable as possible. That's so thank you so much for all these great That's points that you mentioned. One of the things that I want to ask you, actually, it was during your first case, and you mentioned that you, you were supposed to augment the case in a horizontal direction and a little bit in the vertical direction. So you said that when the ridge is like parallel wall like this, you will fix the screws like 45 degrees or 30 degrees, but the top of the screws should be only at the limit of the crest, not more than that, right? Yeah. A, little bit, a little bit below. Usually, a little bit below. Yeah. Below. Yeah, good. So, so when, is it, when it is below the crest, you will gain horizontal augmentation, not vertical augmentation. So I just want to know that in your yeah. first case, you gained the vertical augmentation part two by packing the graft underneath the membrane through the sausage technique, right? You mix two techniques together, yeah. right? Yeah, actually this is what we did. What I did is just, uh, you, 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 when you're doing your overcorrection, you're really packing, you're packing bone and you're, you're making, let's say, a bulk of bone. Not, you're, what, what I do, I, just, I don't only put on the lateral position. I just pack it all over. Yeah, good. This is what I do. I pack it all over. When you're placing your tenting pole 45 degrees or 30 degrees or a little bit inclined, let's say, not to, uh, I don't like this uh, number, I know, 45 or 46, or it's okay, and it's a little bit inclined. It will support your bone in the, in, the, in the vertical position, okay? When you're packing here, the tenting poles will help you as well, holding your bone. Uh, your, if you go like, let's say, uh, like Shukrun and uh, uh, Alain Simon Pierre, and you add a little bit of IPRF to make it sticky, it will help you more. Yeah, so it's the important, uh, how, how we got the two millimeter here, we got it only by packing. That's it. Yeah, that's it. Didn't add any, any screws to the vertical uh, position. Yeah, so one of the things that I also wanted to ask you that, uh, I want to know your experience. Have you used titanium plates, very narrow plates, putting on top of the screws instead of hoodie plates? You know what I'm saying? So we used to reduce yeah. pressure from the flap to the graft because, you know, graft hates it. Yes. So by those screws, we are eliminating the pressure from the flap side to the graft material. I want to know in, in tent pole technique, did you find any difference if you use titanium plates on top of the screws or if you don't use them? I mean, did you find any differences in the results in your experience or not? Uh, unfortunately, I didn't use these plates. It's not really uh, on the market in Kuwait, uh, but I would love to, uh, to use it. Um, the only thing that I would worry about is, um, is it going to affect my flap? Would I have an exposure of these plates? This is the important thing. So if I'm going with these plates, why shouldn't I do titanium mesh? Yeah, because, because titanium mesh is very... Almost the same. So the plates are very narrow. So maybe the risk of exposure is going to be yeah. much less. But I yes. just wanted to know your... Because in both techniques, you are using the screws. But in one, we have a plate on top. The other one, yeah. have... So You're putting your plate. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And even I never use this. Uh, I cannot hear you. 
I mean, I mean, even we can compare them with Huri technique because in Huri technique, we are using a one millimeter thick of cortical bone again with the screws. So imagine if we don't harvest that autogenous bone and use the plate instead of the, I mean, instead of the autogenous. So just wanted to know your experience because you are very familiar with tenfold technique. So just wanted to know if you have any comparison techniques too. Oh. I I've, uh, I I never ha I never did this uh, this uh, procedure uh, due to the lack of material on our market here. But um, yeah, let's keep this in mind. It's nice uh, to uh, to to try one a couple of cases. And I think um, the risk of exposure is not big because it's going to be almost in the middle of the of your flap. And mainly the exposure that's going to happen is uh, where you're closing your. Your your flap, so it's a little bit uh, away from the uh, from your wound or your cut. So yeah, why not? That's I, I, if I do one, I will just share it with you. Thank you, <laughs> Mohammed. I have one more question uh, regarding the case number two. Actually, that case was also very very interesting in my eyes, and you know the most important part was that, as I noticed, your patient was a very deep bite you had a very deep bite you know the the lower risers was almost in contact with the palate so i'm i'm yeah. interested in the results because when you build up the bone you're reducing even more space for the future crown and the occlusal contact and when the implant is placed to the palate i want to know what was the scenario what was the next plan for you in restoring the case I know that we don't have time for that, but but did you have yeah. for the crown regarding that deep bite your patient had? Yeah, actually he has a deep bite, but uh, the emergence of your imp of the implant is really away from the lower incisors. Uh huh. I got yeah, it. He, he, in the photo you're seeing only one. You're, yeah, you're seeing only one. He's deep bite, but yeah. actually he's almost class two. Yeah, class two. Yeah. Yeah, this is it. I got it. I got so it. So the, the, the important thing to start, how we start our implant lately, let's say, not lately, the last 30 years, we started from the prosto to the implant. Yeah. Because we have to restore it. So this is it. So actually, what he was, he was a deep bite, but he was a class two skeletical. So what you see on the frontal is a deep bite, but actually that is almost touching the the the, the palate. But actually, it's a little bit uh, more uh, toward the lingual. So it's easy to place uh, a crown there. So it will not be a, a problem. And Mama, you prefer if I, if I want to ask you that, what is your main preference? intent pole technique for choosing the graph material, I think your answer is gonna be the autogenic pole, right? For making it more predictable. Yeah, uh, usually, uh, I, I, when I started our, my, uh, my, uh, my GBR, I used to do um, just a mixture of, when I'm doing, let's say, um, limited bone augmentations. Uh, I used to uh, mix 50-50 uh, allograft xenograft. Mm -hmm. Over the time, it's stable. But what we see in the studies, uh, mainly when you when what you see in the studies and the papers, uh, when they talk about a mixture of allo and xeno, it's ma it's mainly about socket when they're talking about socket preservation, not about GBRs, in my knowledge. Well, yeah, I, I did my, my research for a long time to find some GBR, just talking about uh, allo and xeno, a mixture of allo and xeno, it's always mixed with autogenous. So uh, I directly shifted to auto autogenous. So I, I just do uh, only, uh, I just do uh, allo and xeno, that was, let's say, five years ago. Lately, when I'm placing, let's say, implants, and uh, and I have to make a uh, combined GBR, combined with GBR. Uh, if I cannot scrap 
usually I use the scraper. If I cannot get too much bone, I just do it layering. I just place my autogenous bone over my implant and then it with a xenograft or a mixture of xeno and allo. But it basically I keep uh, the contact of my implant with autogenous bone only. This is what I, this is how my practice shifted lately. But basically the material of choice, whenever you're going with GBR, uh, place autogenous bone as well. As well, there's um, a study by Professor Islam Urban where he compared uh, if he placed, I think, as I remember, 60 to 40 and uh, 80 to 20. He, he found that, yeah, in the bottom line, he found that the more autogenous he's placing, the more uh, predictability he's getting. Of course, by adding vital cells and boosting your uh, your uh, your GBR, exactly. or bone augmentation. Exactly. Mama, my, my final question. Uh, I don't want to take your time more because your topic, I know, is super interesting, and we can talk about it for hours. But you know, I just want to know your recommendation regarding choosing the screws. Do you have any preference for the diameter of the screws that you're using? Yeah. Uh, in the two cases, you will see two different kinds of screws. Yeah. The first one is 1.4 millimeter with a sm small head. Yeah. The second one is 1.2 millimeter with a large head. My preference is a large head and 1.2. And the smallest, 1.2 millimeter. If it's 1.4, it's not the end of the world. But and the 1.2 is good. But the important part is the head. Whenever you have a large head, it will, have, will make uh, more support to your membrane, you know, basic physics, let's say. So it will, it will support your membrane more. And maybe if you will add like three or four, four uh, denting poles close to each other with large heads, it will work as, as the plates that you were talking about. Exactly, exactly. That was, yeah. A, yeah. That was a great point. Mohamed, I want to thank you so much again for joining me on Hot Seat. I'm so thankful for your beautiful case. I have to say you are a super talented surgeon, and I'm so happy to call you my friend. And really looking forward to see you very soon. Stay mm -hmm. safe. And thank you again for sharing your time. Hats up. Thank you. I was really happy to be with you. Uh, uh, you are very talented, by the way. Uh, I've been following you a long time, for a long time. Uh, thank you for having me with the, on the hot seat. And hopefully uh, what I presented today is fruitful and it's going to help our friends on the social uh, media. And uh, I would like to, uh, uh, to uh, show my Instagram. I will be really happy if any of the audience would like to ask me a question, just send me directly on my Insta. I, I, I don't really uh, check my email every day, but I would check my Instagram every day. So it's easier for me to send me on Instagram. Uh, I was really pleased to uh, be with you. Uh, thank you very much and uh, stay safe. And hopefully this pandemic ends and we can meet uh, uh, in real life. Sure, sure. For all our audience, don't forget to follow Mohamed Bassam's page. There are so many great stuff, much more than what you, what you saw in this presentation, and you will enjoy it. Follow him, and don't forget to talk with him. He's so supportive, and he will answer your questions all the time. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining. Thank you, Mohamed. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.